So Deborah, I would love for you to introduce yourself first because not everyone seeing this video will know you. Oh, well, I'm Deborah Boshinsky. Um, I started studying cranial sacral therapy about 35 years ago and started, I taught a two year program for 25 years. Um, so probably about 13 of those. <laughs> um, I love cranial sacral therapy. I, it was, yeah, you know, we all fall into things we love and this is something I truly love. And I've always been part of the birthing community. I was a doula from a long time ago. Um, and I was drawn that way because of an experience, of course, that I have birthing. So um, I was really about education for, for women and options. And then I decided to become a midwife. So I'm a licensed midwife and have had the awesome pleasure of working with Nicole. So thank you, Nicole. She's one of, one of my favorite people that I got to be in relationship with in this world. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I don't know what else I, I've done pre and perinatal work with um, Ray Costolino and I've done uh, trauma resolution through brain spotting and through SE work. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, what I would like for you to also talk about is um, kind of maybe an overview of, you know, uh, the fetal skull, the bones, but also just how, how you see holding a baby's head or or doing this work um, as it intersects with with birth work oh okay so something general and then just moving into something really specific okay well i do want to say first of all that i'm trained as a biodynamic cranial sacral therapist which is different than what most people are trained in, which is Upledger. And I'm just gonna say a little bit about the differences. And then of course, I will say different uh, people like chiropractors have their training. But biodynamic isn't necess it isn't biomechanical, which means we don't, we don't use the, we don't come in from the outside and use the bones as levers, we kind of, hold the whole system together. So it's not just the bones we touch, but being able to understand all the connections with those bones. And with babies, a lot of times, suggestions are just holding a space where we know they could go, but we don't, we don't tell them they have to go. So um, because we take shape and form around our experiences, and when we're not able to complete an experience all the way through due to overwhelm or trauma, we tend to hold those shapes. So it's more of those shapes of experience that are held in energetic ways in our tissue and in our fluids and in our field. That's more what I'm interested in working with. That being said, you know, Upledger has a lot of wonderful things to to add to the conversation i'm just saying i come in through a different door and it's neither is better or worse they just are different doors it sounds like different doors to birth in general as far as holding yes birth, right yes you know, how we listen to to people while they're laboring and how they're trying to find their own health rather than have a specific plan of 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 how that would look um, right, how how it's supposed to be. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, as a midwife, I always say, I can't have this baby for you, but I can sure help you along the way. Just yeah. by my presence, because we know that witnessing is a very powerful thing. And, of course, our knowledge as midwives and women and mothers or whatever, we, you know, all of our experience that we bring, because it's always about relationship. And, and so when you're at a birth, because you have this history, I'm curious about how you come into relationship with the baby. Well, it depends on why I'm there. As a primary, I found as a primary midwife, it was difficult for me to, to um, track so much 
it's almost like I had to track one field or another. So when I'm there as an assistant or as a doula or a helper in some ways, um, I track babies very differently than when I'm in charge. So I love being a team player. So what I do is um, a lot of times, you know, again, it's just about relationship, how that baby or mom will allow me to be in relationship with them. So I, I love tracking them. A lot of times I don't necessarily know everything that happens because we perceive so differently. Everybody perceives and I'm very kinesthetic where pe other people might be very visual and that's their go-to or even auditory. Um, I have a very strong olfactory sense. So sometimes I'll smell things and go, hmm. <laughs> and, but, um, you know, like sometimes I'll be at a birth and mom might need something and I just kind of have to sit there and see if I can be of any help. And my question is always, is there something I can help with here? And sometimes it's just literally just touching certain places or have them change position just a little bit. And, and they're ready to pop anyway. They're just not quite there. And it's, it's kind of like to an agreement, it's always more powerful. So just coming into relationship with someone and letting that agreement shift things. And, and that happens, it's very powerful. So I'll give you an example. With, with one um, birth I was at, mom was having a very difficult time pushing. I mean, <laughs> she was really pushing. And I happened to have a relationship with this woman. And so I just kind of sat back for a while and go, what can I do? I was kind of getting frustrated. And then I realized that she, she has a tendency to hold all of her uh, tension right through here. So I asked her if I could just, it, it was like a thought that came to me. And I asked if I could just put my hands on the, her front and back. That's called the transverse diaphragm. And they relate to each other all the way down the body, up and down the body. And it relates to the pelvic diaphragm. So I just held that, and I think I held it for maybe 30, 40 seconds, and you literally could feel the energy just pop. And everybody in the room actually went, what just happened? <laughs> and I went, I don't know. And I just backed away, and then she was able to push her baby out within like, you know, half hour. So it's about how do you get the information? Because it's, people are trying to have people hear them. So my job is to be able to hear as best I can. What do you need? How can I help you? And um, it's just like anything with intention. If you just hold that intention, the information usually comes to you. Yeah. Not necessarily in the form you want or think it should be, but it will come to you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I'm, you know, I appreciate this aspect of deep listening you know, um, in birth and in prenatal care, or in postpartum care. And, you know, I want to, I want to think about the babies and how you listen to the babies and how do they communicate to you? Well, they're, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm just, you know, as we know, these babies come with their own personalities already. And, they all have stories to tell and they're all so unique. So again, I just try to listen and, um, and have an appropriate boundary with them. I don't, I really work with keeping my energy in a place that doesn't come in on them really hard because they're very, um, they're very aware of energy. <laughs> and so, um, it just depends on what I'm hearing. Um, sometimes though, if a baby's having a hard time, I will go to that midline and really pay attention to the midline. I really calm myself. You have to, you know, you really have to settle into yourself. And again, just listen. And sometimes there's some techniques that I do if I don't know how to do something and it's more of a, a need in the moment. Um, I can do that also. But a lot of times babies just need to be with mom, on mom, 
And sometimes I might be a part of that, um, but I try not to be if I don't need to be there because to let them find their way together. But sometimes, as we know, they need a little help. But to be really cognizant of how you approach a baby, even in those kind of situations. And so sometimes I'll just think, you know, I'm coming in now, this is my energy, and I'm just going to be with you right here, something like that. So it's just not like, I'm going to take care of this, I'm going to fix this, you know, it's, no, there's, there's something happening here, and how can we all dance with it in a healthy way? Yeah. Babies are really smart. You know, I'm, my new thing is just talking about how they have this inside information. Um, they do. And, and inside, meaning inside, you know, the space that they are in, but also inside here that they're mm -hmm. aware of then in a different oh. way than we are because we've gotten mm -hmm. so used to different um, awareness and distractions. Mm -hmm. um, and as babies come down um, in the birth process, mm. they're bodies and their heads begin to find their way. And I'm, I was wondering if maybe you could talk about a little bit about that process for them. Well, um, as we all know, babies' heads mold. And what's molding very much so is the squama of, of the bone. So for instance, I'm gonna show you this is a, an adult um, occipital bone. So this is the squama up here. And everything on the top of the head is called squama. But here we have the basal part, and that's a cartilaginous part of the sphenoid, of the occipital bone. This is the sphenoid. And this is, you know, there's a lot of cartilaginous um, material right here. They meet like this. And, um, and I'm, I'm bringing these two up because they're at the base of the uh, cranium, but they're extremely important part of the head. So we see this outside part of the head and how the sutures come together. Um, but here, we have the sphenoid, and this is the greater wings of the sphenoid right here. You can touch them right here. And this is what we call the major gear. And for the whole, your whole um, bony body in your body. So all, you have this movement that goes like this. I'm, I'm making it very big, but it's much more subtle than that. And this bone right here is a major gear. Every other bone in the head follows the occiput. But this is opposite. And so it cranks everything. So you can see how important this particular relationship is in, in the whole body. And I could go on and on about that, but I'll stop there. <laughs> so all the bones, and. Here's some parietal bones, or I'll show you on this baby, the parietal bones right through here. Mm -hmm. And here's the occiput. Here's the temporal bone that comes in relationships with this parietal bone. Here's the frontal bone. And he, <clears throat> most of these are all the bones that follow the occiput are bilateral. That means there's two on each side, including the frontal bone, which forms into bones and comes together through that um, mitopic suture. Here's the sagittal suture, the lambdoid suture, and then you have these sutures through here. Um, so all of these bones at the, the crown, really they're membranous. So they're very soft. We are literally moldable until we're about three years old. That's why these things they put on babies' heads. <laughs> what do they call them? Helmets? Yeah. 
you know, and that's why you don't want to have babies laying on their back too much because we're getting a lot of flat heads. We're not supposed to have flat heads. Now, when you look at this skull, what do you see? Well, I, I see not, the, I see posterior molding that that baby was probably posterior for a while. Probably. <laughs> Just because you can, you know, it's like one of those jigsaw, you put all the puzzle pieces together and kind of go back and see a little bit of history. Yeah. Oh, you definitely see history in the bones and you can even see how, so they had a lot of anterior, posterior compression, mm -hmm. a lot. So this is called a shear. When you see something like that, when those bones are driven up underneath the parietal bones, I have a feeling this was, this was made from a, a mold, probably a baby didn't make it, is my guess. And probably might even be eight months, mm -hmm. maybe full time. But um, so this shear is going to really affect those greater wings or the sphenoid. And what that, that kind of shear does literally takes the sphenoid and drives it upward. So it's a shear upward mm -hmm. or a shear downward. And that's mm -hmm. probably a downward shear because it's going to drive that back. And then sometimes this gets really stuck. So we have to, you know, really pay attention. Whenever I'm working with anyone, but particularly a baby, where's the movement? What's moving? What bones are moving? What sutures are free? And then kind of figure out why that is. Because it's not always just at the bony level. It could be in the dural tube. Because that dural tube goes all the way around the brain and has very specific attachments here along the petrous ridge of the temporal bone. The temporal bone is the bone that holds your ear. So we have this bone right here. It's the temporal bone. Here's the squama and here's the cartilaginous part which comes into relationship with the sphenoid and the occiput and very specifically with the dural tube comes around here and all the way around the back and to the other side. And that's, um, so you can see that. And just the tension that pulls through there. Yeah. Um, could you by chance um, pull out the fetal skull again? Mm -hmm. And um, just kind of, do a quick, I, I know you named all the bones, but if you could name the bones and then open up and, and show some of the things that you've just shown us internally okay. to the baby. I forgot this head came off. <laughs> <laughs> so you want me to name all the outside bones? Yeah, just real fast. Okay. Um, so this is the frontal bone. Mm -hmm. And here's the mitopic suture, which is part of that frontal um, um, the, the fontanelle, the anterior fontanelle. Here are the parietal bones mm -hmm. with the sagittal suture. Here's the occiput coming in relationship to the parietals, and that's the lambdoid suture. Here is the temporal bone, which holds um, your ear. And then we have all the facial bones that hang off, but we're not going to talk about that now. But I do want to let you know that the eye socket is formed by seven bones. So, so you have a lot of sutures in there that need yeah. to be moving and a lot of foramen or holes that uh, are being innervated through those foramens. So um, then we will take off the head. And let's see if I can see that. Can yeah, go a little that? higher. A little higher. There you go. There you go. Okay. So <laughs> do this like. So here's uh, the um, Petrus Ridge, and you can see how it comes all the way around to here. They both come in to the sphenoid, and that's where they connect through there. 
And you can see with this bone, there are no ridges like in Look how much pull there is there. Mm -hmm. So that all has to do with tension. So when we begin to crawl and move and even these mastoid processes right here, you'll see are no big deal, but as adults, and that's just from tension, from standing, crawling, walking, being alive. Um, so, and here's that sphenobasal junction that we were talking about. And you can see how the sphenoid comes into relationship with the frontal bone right there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different foramen through here. See the holes? Yeah. So that's where a lot of our cranial um, nerves go through. So one of the things when you have a baby that's really cranky or really... Um, colicky. Um, a lot of times there might be an impingement on um, some of the nerves like the vag vagus nerve mm -hmm. innervates down through the body particularly to our digestive tract. Yeah. Um, but there's a there's a lot of things that can happen with that. Um, so with the molding you were talking about earlier shears um, and there's normal there's normal adaptations of the skull too yes very much so what are those well then you know we seem at birth when you have you know a head that goes like this and um, but that's all that memberness and then a lot of times what we're looking for when we come back the next day um, is how is that molding shifting which help nursing is like huge in working with molding. Um, and, you know, sometimes with a new baby, it's hard to tell uh, if something's um, not moving properly. Um, again, I have a really hard time working with babies unless they're really struggling uh, to get in there and um, be in relationship with that. I want to see what they're going to do with their molding. Um, but if they're really struggling with nursing or something like that, that's that's a whole nother ball game. And that's usually what we're looking for. Or a really unsettled baby. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can work with that. But again, it's coming into relationship, understanding the levels, being able to hold a hole uh, and seeing how they can work it out. But molding can, um, like I was saying with digestion, um, mostly digestion at this point, sleep sometimes is a big deal. But we have to realize that babies orient to mom and they orient to mom's midline. And so they're always, you know, that's their metrodome. They just, you know, that's where they go. So if mom's really having a bit of a time, um, baby's going to follow her and her nervous system typically. So a lot of times I like to work with moms too, because this is a huge event, bringing a baby into the world on so many levels and particularly postpartum. And um, so is that answering your question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's answering my question. Um, I think I also wanted to just have you also talk briefly about you know, for, for like midwives or for mid midwifery students, you know, the different ways that the head as baby um, comes around, how they might have to comp compensate when, let's say things are asynclitic. Right. Right. Well, there's, there's just so much compensation, you know, you can see maybe how, what they call a side bend. I'm going to bring out this because Again, these are the gears, the major gears. So I'm just going to show you some shapes that can happen. So this is called a torsion. Mm -hmm. A torsion. But you don't typically have a torsion without a side bend. This is a side bend. And you can have a side bend and a torsion. Um, these are all things that are natural. Your body it's meant to do that. You know, this, this particular joint is meant to be able to torsion and to side bend. But again, 
we're looking to see how those release. When you get into a shearing place, that's non-physiological. So what's happening there is this is, um, that's a left shear, a right shear. It literally shears. And, or you can have a superior shear or an inferior shear. And so those are all. And when do shear, are shears more likely, most likely to happen in a, in a birth setting? Well, this baby had a shear. Yeah. So this was a posterior presentation or, um, you know, just, you know, any sort of impact where they might get caught on one, uh, like if their parietal is caught on one side and yet they keep rotating, mm -hmm. that, can, that can cause a shear or it can just cause a side bend depending on how intense it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and sometimes babies are born with vacuums. Um, what happens with the skull? I mean, I know that there's much more than the skull involved. Oh yeah. Um, with that. That's, that's really something. Um, so you're putting a vacuum on this membranous, very moldable skull that is very much attached to this dural tube, which is very attached to the brain. Yeah. You know, and the dural tube goes all through the head, down through the foramen magnum, big hole, a lot of attachments right through there, goes down. So it does affect everything. You know, it can very much so. Um, and that's a lot of times very, it's, it can, it's overwhelming for the baby. So that's not something that they can release that easily. Yeah. And it's always good to talk to moms and say, you know, when you're nursing, you know, touch the head and lovingly and rub it and say, you can let this go. That was, that was quite an experience, you know, just talk to the baby and let them know that, yeah, that happened. And that was whatever. I mean, when you start talking to a baby, usually about something that was hard for them, mm -hmm. they'll start crying. So you just acknowledge that was scary or that was that was hard or that was that made you really mad i mean you try to pick up what the baby's saying and reflect back to them what you're seeing whether that's what they're doing or not doesn't really matter they know you're really there present with them and acknowledging what happened huge important thing to resolve anything in any circumstance <laughs> you know yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking about what you're saying, and you know, I think we have we're on the same page that how important the nervous system is of the baby. Yes, and how it's integral to how the head is fashioned, or how the um, how how the fluids move in the body, and how physiology and health comes into balance. And but I think about teaching new midwives. Like, how do these come together, you know? Um, and so I was, I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts about that and, and like in talking to newer midwives about how everything, how this work you're talking about um, applies to what they can do. Like if there's any advice or any knowledge of that connection. Hmm, that's a broad question. <laughs> it's a very broad question. <laughs> I guess one of the things that's really important to me, and I really want to emphasize so much, is that as we are in relationship with this baby and feeling, perceiving whatever we can, because we're all at different levels. I mean, you start by learning, right? And you have to be willingly fallible to stand in the presence of miracles. So, you know, you just got to, learn that the work teaches you so be teachable but one of the things i've and don't be afraid you know we're all human beings let's find a way together and we have to be vulnerable to do that so um whenever i come into relationship with the baby i always before i come into physical contact with them i am very much in their field and see if I'm invited in. Some babies push me away because of their experience, 
maybe their personality, maybe all of that. So I have to wait until they feel safe enough for me to be able to come into relationship with them physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's what we really do as midwives too, as we are with someone in the most intimate time of their life. And I think for me, cranial sacral is very intimate also because they're giving you information and how you hold that information is really important. So learning how to be neutral and not judge anything and to approach it with curiosity. And, um, and yet we do have knowledge. So it's just a matter of this dance that we do of coming into relationship with the knowledge that we do have physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. <laughs> And how do we come into relationship? And it's kind of like a computer, like how's the connection <laughs> at a particular time? So I wait to be invited in. And then once I'm invited in, I'll you know, ask for permission to touch. Usually if I'm, they've invited me and I have permission to touch. And then you know, I'll just go and see where I hold the whole body and just see where they call me. A lot of times now I can do that off body without even touching them, just kind of noticing something. But you know, having your hands on is really important. I worked with a baby here recently, was having a hard time nursing. And when I held her head, I was floored. So, I mean, like I said, this, they, it's a constant learning, but her head was just like this. Now her head wasn't moving, but this whole thing was happening inside her head. That was her dural tube that was showing me that it was just wonky and didn't know how to settle and was still in this uh, pattern of, of coming around as we know we have to move around and come out. But she was caught in that place. So it was just a matter of going, wow, that's a lot. That's very strong pull. And I just acknowledged it. And then I came into my midline and helped her find hers. And then she found her way, you know, and, um, you know, I'm no magical person. I'm just someone who we, we, that listens and, and knows the system um, pretty well. <laughs> I'm not in kindergarten anymore. But again, it is a constant learning that we're doing. And what are you showing me? And what, what could that possibly mean? And it, you know, just like anything, it's a skill that you learn. It's a perceptual skill in a lot of ways. We use our hands. We use our eyes. We use our intuition, um, we, we use our knowledge. And so it's just building on that. Thank you. Um, I think this will probably be our last question, but I, I wanted um, you to talk briefly about labor. Mm -hmm. And during labor, as babies are descending and rotating and flexing and doing whatever they do, they need to do to find their way out, um, I'm, I'm curious about this relationship of the baby to the, the, the birth giver, right? Like what that is, what that relationship is and, and how that baby's and the baby and the, and the pregnant body are coming into relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, again, for me, I've just noticed as present as mom can be in labor land with her baby. It's very helpful. And really acknowledging this is a team effort that baby's finding their way and mom's finding her way and they're doing that together. And to be able, just really encourage mom to, to be able to listen or touch into mom with, you know, so what's happening with baby just now, you know? How, how do you feel the baby move? And I'm, I'm just really always encouraging that sort of um, ability. And I, working with moms prenatally, I'm, I'm always working with that. You know, how do you feel your baby moving? What, do you have a sense of what your baby's doing or the personality or, you know, whatever information you're getting? You know, my son, three days before he was born, told me he was a boy. Everyone told me he was a girl, right? I'm a boy, my name's Jonathan. And I'm like, 
So, I mean, we can, we can perceive things in so many different ways and to really encourage that with moms. Um, so the journey together is just that, and it needs to be acknowledged as that, that one unit that you've been building for nine months and how important that is for everybody to acknowledge that. And sometimes it's really, you know, hard for moms to even think about it. It's like, get this thing out of my body or, you know, they're so, um, you know, caught up in, in whatever they're feeling and sensing and their beliefs and all the thing that goes into birth. But, um, so I think it's really important to prep them ahead of time in a lot of different ways of knowing this is a team effort and everybody's doing their best and knowing their body the best they can, their babies the best they can. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I appreciate you taking this time. Um, you know, I, we've been doing a, a, a storytelling class recently. Um, we've been doing an online one with some people and um, just thinking about bones in so many different ways, right? Oh, like, yes. About seeing the bones to life. Yes. And we're thinking about um, what those bones are and what they mean, how they're structured. And, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the depth for which you listen to bone. Oh, thank you. I do want to say one other thing, if that's okay, that's is okay. that Hugh Milne is, um, he does The Heart of Listening. It's a book two books he's made it into two books now and he actually has um the purpose of each bone he gives you know and he talks very much about the um the ethmoid bone so the ethmoid bone sits right here and right there is you can see how it kind of bumps out a little bit yeah that's called the yeah and that's where the superior aspect of the um fox or the aspect of the dural tube comes off and around. And um, he compares that, it's a very airy bone that sits down in there in that frontal bone. And it's really airy, it's got a lot of holes and everything. And he, since that's our, our bone of directionality, birds have that. And they know that that has a lot to do with migration. So there's a sense of directionality through that bone. That's just one bone, but it's very fun. I do want to say one other thing too that could be maybe helpful for midwives um, is that sometimes sutures will um, fuse be before they're supposed to. And that's called cranial stenosis. And that's not a good thing. So if you've seen, like sometimes <laughs> I always look at people's moldings, especially if they're bald men. I just love to go, oh, <laughs> looking all over their stuff and see what's happening there. But sometimes you'll see people who have literally a pointed head. And uh, a lot of that, they're probably their sagittal suture is um, fused at a very young age. Some sutures, it clearly doesn't matter that much because the brain just grew out a different way. But in some of the sutures, it's really um, debilitating. And you can have some symptomologies. Not that you can't have symptomologies with that one, but like through the mitopic suture, mm -hmm. uh, if that fuses too early, you might have a pointed sort of unicorn look. Or we had one baby whose all of her sutures in one of her orbits were fused. So they look very different. And um, so if you see a baby that's kind of wonky <laughs> and you feel their head and, and get used to kind of perceiving when you feel heads, how hard or soft they feel, see if they feel like fluidy, feel if they feel like they're moving, um, start perceiving that, just playing with it is really important to touch bones and see what sort of element you're feeling like if hard as a rock, or I can feel the fluid in this and the breathing, the air. Um, so those, those are some things I just want midwives to know that you can start doing. Just feel the bone and let it talk to you and see what it's saying. Yeah, and if we listen, then what happens? Well, when you listen and you reflect back, I see you, I see what's happening. And 
then there's a lot of different things can happen. And one of them is they could be just a motion towards something different of movement because you're always looking for movement it doesn't have to be a specific movement in a specific way you're looking at how can you move not how do i want you to move yeah. because there's layers upon layers of information there so i can crank your head and make this bell move i know the technique to do it but then how does that impact everything else i don't know but you do in your system you know so um so sometimes there's often some sort of reaction of acknowledgement. I've been seen. And when we've been seen and deeply listened to, how do you feel? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, oh, I just had a cup of tea with my friend, you know. <laughs> things feel a little more settled. I feel a little more, you know, in myself. And so there's a lot of different things that can begin to happen when you're deeply hurt. It's amazing what happens when you just witnessed, right? And so just witnessing these babies mm -hmm. can allow babies to be able to move and, and, and find health. Acknowledge they can do that. They can, you know, I'll hold your hand while you do it, or I'll hold your bone, or I'll hold your whatever you need me to hold, and, and I'll be with you. And look how powerful you are. Let's start empowering each other. There's so many ways we can empower each other. You know, we don't have to make it about me. I think you can, you can edit this part out. But when, when I started going into quarantine, which I've been in almost a year, and had to give up or chose to give up a lot of my practice for now, I begin to say, well, who am I? You know, I'm a midwife. I'm a cranial sacral therapist. You know, all this I am, and I realized I am not any of those things, and really having to sit with myself. And I think it's probably made me a really better whatever else I get to play with. You know, I have these skills. That's not who I am. Yeah. And so that I think is empowering for whoever I come in relationship, as long as I come in relationship in that way, person to person. You know, how can we relate? And I see all the health and power in you. And you can begin, you know, what are we paying attention to? And it's really important what we pay attention to. And in biodynamic craniosacral therapy, we are taught that's what we pay attention to. What's the health in the system? Where's the potency? Where's the movement? Come into relationship with that. And then all the other places that are having trouble moving or whatever can go, oh, I have something to orient to now. I have some health over here. That's where the power is. Yeah. So you don't go right to the, <laughs> the, the place that's screaming like, help me. <laughs> you just come and go, I hear that. That's, a, that's really a tough place. Yeah. And where's the help here? <laughs> yeah. Reminds me of some births we've been to. Um, thank you so much for for talking. Oh, thank today. you for letting me share. I'm gonna um, go ahead and pause or. or